Today's reading this morning comes from uh, 2 Peter, chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from, cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the reading this morning. Good morning. So if you have your Bibles and you haven't turned there yet, we're Second Peter 1. Uh, let's pray to start. Father in heaven, um, we come before you this morning remembering that we are a needy people, that we do not have in ourselves what we need um, to hear your word um, and believe it and live in it and walk as you would have us walk. But God, we are dependent in you for all things, um, that we need your word and we need your spirit to give us understanding that we might know and walk in it. Father, I pray as we, we go through this text um, that you would be uh, working in each heart here, um, that you'd be convicting um, and leading to, to deeper love and faith in you. So yeah, be with us this morning. Um, give each one what they need to hear well. In Jesus' name, amen. So what would happen if tomorrow morning you woke up and you could not see? I'm guessing there would be moments of panic, there would be a scream for help, there would be a trip to the hospital, there would be many tests to try and find a solution to your blindness. It's a scary thought to wake up blind tomorrow, but in some ways what the Bible presents is even scarier, to think that you can be blind spiritually and not know it. In this case, you would just keep plowing forward as if nothing was wrong. If you were to do this, the risk of seriously, serious bodily harm um, or even death would be high if you were to do this in a physical sense. The Bible presents spiritual blindness as something that you will not necessarily perceive and consequently you just keep plowing forward in life, not knowing you are bumbling around the place, knocking things over, and not accomplishing anything of real meaning. And all of this chaos leading to an eternal separation from the giver of sight. Now the Bible is quite clear that there are many who believe they are saved, but in reality their heart has not been circumcised by God. Their soul is still bound to carnal desires, and they are not set free to glory in God. So this text in 2 Peter this morning, I believe it has two purposes. The first is that it can be a great encouragement um, to believers to grow up in their faith. And the second is that God might graciously expose spiritual blindness in those who think they are believers, but are still bumbling around in the dark. And so this morning, I want to walk through the first 11 verses in 2 Peter and allow God's word to direct us in how to grow in our faith and thereby give us assurance that we do in fact belong to Jesus. 
So as we enter Second Peter this morning, I want to take a few minutes just to get our bearings um, to orientate us to the book, and then we'll, we'll get into the meat of it here shortly. Uh, so the first thing to notice about first, or Second Peter uh, is it's written by Peter, Simeon Peter, he begins. Um, Peter was an eyewitness and disciple of Jesus for, for his earthly ministry. He saw the power of Jesus to heal. He saw the compassion of Jesus for the hurting and the broken. He saw the glory of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. He saw the humiliation and death of Jesus on the cross. He spoke and he ate with Jesus after his resurrection. And Jesus commissioned him to be an apostle and a pastor to the church. Peter received the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, and he preached a sermon where 3,000 believed on Jesus for salvation in, at one time. He wrote letters to, of guidance and counsel to the churches as faith in Jesus spread throughout the known world, and this is one of those letters. And so the letter begins, Simeon Peter, a servant. I think it's really cool that shortly before Jesus' death, Peter was involved in an argument with the other disciples about which one would be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And now Peter introduces himself as a servant. He's a slave of Jesus Christ. He has accepted the heavenly freedom of being a simple slave in the kingdom of God. He understands himself to exist for the sole purpose of doing the bidding of the Heavenly Father without question or reservation. But alongside being a slave, he understands himself as being an apostle, a sent one, someone who's been sent with Jesus to go out with the message of the gospel. In the second half of verse 1, we have who the letter is addressed to. So it's to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Some translations say to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, have received a faith as precious as ours. The Apostle Peter himself, who had seen the resurrected Jesus face to face, um, he says to us, you have received a faith as precious as ours. Um, Peter had experienced him in profound ways, but the cool thing about faith is that it is the, not the character of the truster, of the person who is putting the faith in the object. It is actually the, the, the one who faith is in that is the real difference maker. It's significant that our faith is rooted in the eternal God and not in you and I and our ability to muster and the amount that we can bring to the table. And I think that's what Peter is getting at here. He is the one who had been with Jesus, walked with Jesus, received the power of the Holy Spirit, seen healings and people put their faith in Jesus. And now he is saying, and you who have received a faith of equal standing with ours, you who have received a faith as precious as ours, it is as if he's not looking at himself but he is looking at the one who his faith is in and saying, you can have him too. You have him too. <laughs> not, a, not a you can, he's saying you do. So the, um, Jesus came and bore the weight of justice that our sins demanded that he might, while continuing to be righteous, claim us and redeem us to be his own possession, his servants and sent ones. And so we have Peter the servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, the servant and sent one, writing to those who have a faith as precious as his. We are servants and sent ones as well. Verse 2. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Now, grace and peace is a fundamental pursuit of most people. Many a person seeks after the favor and blessing of God, and many people look for inner tranquility and a rest for their soul. Unfortunately, it is all too common to seek these things in the wrong way. Many people naturally perceive or hear that God is just 
and holy. And so under the weight of their shame and guilt, they feel compelled to bring something to the table. So under the weight of their shame and guilt, they try and strike a deal with God through good works. Something like, if I am kind, honest, generous, if I'm diligent in prayer, if I read my Bible, if I go to church, then God must look upon me with favor. He must permit me entrance to glory. He must keep my loved ones safe and bless me with a reasonably comfortable and happy life. Some of us might not be so bold as to say that out loud, but if we examine our hearts, we might find we, we truly do expect God to do that for us because of how we are living. But the problem with this attitude is we are still seeing God as someone who is unfavorable toward us, and we're trying to twist his arm into giving us what we think we need. We have not come to that place of surrender and submission that trusts him and his goodness to give us what we need in his timing. The other part of trying to strike a deal with God based on works is you end up seeing his commands as rules or burdens or chores to be done to earn his favor, all the while missing that they are his gracious wisdom and his counsel in your life. He's not your wise father. He is your, <laughs> your, your king that you have to twist the arm to get to do what you want. The Bible pre re represents God as one who graciously gives to you all things through Christ as you come to him in faith. And so we don't earn his favor. It is a gift given through his son. And so Peter begins by saying grace to you. God is a God who offers grace and peace. Peace is the other thing that we often find ourselves pursuing. Now, discontentment in our fast-paced, high-stress, materially driven lifestyle has left many people to seek peace and tranquility um, in other places, maybe in Eastern practices or meditation or yoga. The focus is to move away from becoming and attaining to just simply being and experiencing gratitude. And so something like meditation becomes the avenue to peace. When life gets overwhelming, stop and be still. Listen to the air going in and out of your lungs. Listen to your heartbeat. Get lost in the experience of simply being. List all the things you are grateful for. Dwell on the positive and not the negative. But whether you are trying to find peace through your works, through, through gaining and attaining something, or whether you are trying to find peace through tranquility of stopping and just simply being, there's one fundamental problem in seeking peace in this way. It's that you still live in a world full of disease, theft, war, famine, deceit, slander, exhaustion, moral failure, and ultimately death. You are trying to seek peace in a creation that is in turmoil. It's full of destruction and decay. And the reason why it is in turmoil is human beings have set themselves against God and persist in stubborn rebellion. And so the true peace that Christianity has to offer is a turning back to God and a realization that he is for you. And so even though sickness comes, even though you lose your job, even though you feel anxious and incapable at work, even though the circumstances of your life feel overwhelming, you have this confidence that you are in the hands of the risen king. You have this confidence that you, you have peace in the middle of a world of chaos, even as he is making th all things new. And so this is the grace and peace that is offered to those whose faith is in Jesus. It says, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. That word multiplication, that's a big deal. It's not just added to you a little bit. It's, it's multiplied to you, um, lavished upon you, to use the, the words of Ephesians. Um, it's as if Peter actually believes that grace and peace is a real and life-giving thing in the life of a believer. It's not just something we, we hope to have one day. It's something that God 
graciously gives to his people day by day um, as they live in faith. Verse 3, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And so right there, we need to stop and consider what he just said. How much power is God's divine power? Well, it's, it's all of it, right? It's, it's all the power that exists. Think of the universe being spoken into existence. Think of Jesus calming the storm. Think of Jesus feeding, multiplying one big lunch into 5,000 lunches. Think of Jesus telling Lazarus not to be dead anymore, and Lazarus actually listening to him. Think of God through the Holy Spirit raising Jesus from the dead, never to die again. God's power is able to do whatever he wills. He can do whatever he says. And here he is promising that his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Another way of saying this is that God's power has given us everything we need to have true life and live a godly life. How many of us believe that? Deep in our guts, do you you believe that? How does God do this? God has availed his great power to us um, to give us all we need to life and godliness. Look at the second part of verse 3. It is through, through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and goodness. So his infinite power has granted us all things that we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of him. Colossians 3 would say we are being renewed in the image of our creator. We must realize that partaking in life and godliness isn't some mystical, secret, complicated, higher knowledge sort of process. Rather, it is a simple growing in the knowledge of our God. It's growing in the knowledge of what our God is like. It's setting our minds and our hearts on Him and being renewed as we come to the the giver of life, the designer of life, the one who loves life. I want to share just an illustration I heard in a sermon one time. Um, It it was a guy named Matt Chandler, and and he talks about if he wanted to tell his wife about his love for her, if he got home and she was on the couch and he went and kneeled down in front of her and grabbed her on the calves and just looked up at her and said, Lauren, I love you so much. I just love your brown hair and your deep hazel eyes and... He said that would just be a, it would be a lovely way to show my wife my affection for her, except for the fact that my wife has blonde hair and she has blue eyes. You can imagine how that would go, right? That's just stuck with me. And I think that tells us about how we want to worship God sometimes. We, we want to feel what God is like in ourselves and bring that to him and say, God, I just love that you're like this. But we need to be careful that that's who God actually is. We need to remember that we need to be renewed in knowledge after the image of our Creator. And in so doing, we will be able to approach Him in genuine worship in the way that will please His heart. And that's that's what we have on the table here is that, that He is working that in us. He is working the knowledge of Him in us. And so, His divine power gives us everything we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who, who what? Through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. And so his glory is his beauty, his splendor, his power. His excellence is his moral perfection, his goodness, his kindness. So Jonathan Edwards in his essay on the ends for which God created the world Uh, argues that because God is the most beautiful, most precious, most glorious, most excellent being in the universe, the most loving thing he can do for us is give himself to us and allow us to enjoy or worship his beauty and glory and excellence. 
Verse 4 continues by saying that by his glory and excellence, he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you be, may become partakers of the divine nature. And so this is where I think we need to take a step back and just, just consider some of the promises of God. I've just pulled out a few um, for this morning's purposes, but this is a practice you can have in your life of, of just stopping and considering where in the infallible word of God has God made a promise, and that promise will never change. He is God. He doesn't lie. And so, so I, just, I, I just pulled out a few. Uh, think of how Adam and Eve sinned, and they were cast out of the garden, and God promised that one day he would, through Eve's offspring, crush Satan. That has some implications for the world you live in today, does it not? Think of how Isaiah 66, 1 to 2 says, Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me and what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made and so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in heart, oh, sorry, contrite in spirit, and trembles at my word. What a promise that we can look to God and his immensity and all that he is, and we have this promise that he looks to you as you come with a humble and contrite heart trembling before him, that the great king of the universe would love people who do that is, is astounding. What about this one? Isaiah 25, 6 to 9. On this, mountain, the, on this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is our Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in our salvation. What a promise. What a way to live, to wait for that day. I would, I would argue that changes our day to day. That hope changes how our hearts respond to the turmoil in the world even now, does it not? The promises of God lead us to have hearts that are shaped in a certain way, and this is, this is how God is leading us into participating in his divine nature. It's living by faith instead of by sight. How about Romans 8.11? If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And so how do we know and relate to his glory and excellence? It is through his very great and precious promises. There are vast and precious promises that God gives to us in his word, and because he is glory and ex glorious and excellent, he doesn't lie. We can absolutely trust him. And so as we move forward with trusting God and his promises, we actually become partakers in his divine nature. This is how our knowledge of God becomes how God in his great power gives to us everything we need for life and godliness. Finally, at the end of verse 4, we see that now that we are partakers in Jesus' divine nature, we have escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. We cannot be partakers of the divine nature and simultaneously be in bondage to sinful desire. When we are in Christ, we are no longer enslaved under corruption, which leads to deeper and deeper immorality and selfish sinful desire. Rather, our hope is that we are no longer in slavery to sin, but we've been liberated to be servants of Jesus. 
And now he is teaching us to obey all that he has commanded. He is, his divine power is now giving us everything we need for life and godliness. The one leads to deeper and deeper corruption and decay and death. And the other is God working in you to lead you out of that corruption into ever-increasing life. That is the, the offer on the table here. And so... In summary, let's work through verses 3 and 4 just once more all at once, trying to see the full picture, and then let's see how it relates to verse 5. So if you happen to zone out at some point in the last 10 minutes, or you're really confused right now, zone back in. This is a really important connection, and you can have the benefit of it all if you focus for the next two minutes, okay? So his divine power that is the very power of God, has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. That is, God has given us all we need for a full and a godly life. Through, how does this come to us? Through the knowledge of him who has called us to his glory and excellence, by which, by his glory and excellence, he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them, these precious and very great promises, you may become partakers in the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. And so this is verse 3 and 4. And now in verse 5, we have, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. And so did you see it? Did you see the connection? It is for this very reason, because God's divine power has given us every, uh, everything we need for life and godliness, it's for this reason that we make every effort. In the strength God gives, we strive with all the strength, effort, and creativity we possess to supplement our faith with virtue, knowledge, self-control, steadfastness, godliness, brotherly affection, love. So do you see how when your faith is in God, it is God who is empowering you with everything you need for life and godliness, and this motivates you. It gives you the courage necessary to pursue obedience with effort, with vigor, with all of your strength. Obedience is not in opposition of faith, as Josh has been pounding in Romans over and over again. It's the obedience of faith. Obedience is the necessary and commanded consummation of faith. If robust obedience does not follow faith, it is not faith that God has wrought. Once again, it is because God in his great power has given us everything we need for life and godliness that we make every effort to add to our faith these things of godly character. So let's unpack these things that are, we are to make effort at this week. The first on the list is virtue. So virtue is moral excellency or goodness. Doing to others as we would have them do to us. It's ridding ourselves of slander and instead committing to encouraging and building up our neighbor. It's putting to death anger and instead showing patience and meekness. It's putting away judgment and instead seeking to save your neighbor from the coming judgment. It's to abstain of taking advantage to the vulnerable and instead seeking to treat the poor and the outcast, the lonely, um, as your brother and your neighbor. Virtue is putting to death and abstaining from acts of moral depravity and instead practicing justice and right conduct. To virtue, we are to add knowledge. Knowledge is to seek to know God deeply. Learn what he loves and what he hates. Learn what God is like, what matters most to him, what grieves his heart. Set your will upon having a deep and rich knowledge of God. You must not consider time spent in his word and time spent under godly teaching to be wasted. Make effort 
to know God. This is your very life. Self-control. Proverbs 25, 28 says, a man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. Anything can walk into it and bring destruction, confusion, change. It is God's will for your life that you should be in control of your passions and desires, submitting all things to his will and instruction, and that you might act wisely and in accordance with what is true and right. Next, we are to add steadfastness. This is to have perseverance, to have constancy, consistency in your faith, to understand that faith in Jesus doesn't mean that all trial will be deflected away from you, but rather faith in trusting that Jesus allows trials, that your faith might be tested, that it might be shown to be really, really valuable and reliable. James 1.2 says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be complete and perfect, lacking in nothing. Godliness, we are to add to our faith godliness. Now, this is a particular word. It, it actually means that we are meant to be pious or religious. That's not necessarily a common one these days, and not many people want to be considered religious or pious. But hear me out. We are meant to be religious in the way God has designed true religion to be. In the Old Testament, this did mean being a part of the life of the nation of Israel. It meant to live with justice and consideration for your neighbor, to be generous and kind to the foreigner and the traveler, to participate in all the feasts and the festivals that celebrated our God. It meant to go to the temple to worship, to bring thank offerings, to sacrifice animals and grieve over your sin, to find the forgiveness of God in your life. Since the coming of Jesus, godliness or piety has meant being involved in the life of the church to have reverence for God and to live out that reverence in your daily life, to be devoted to God in prayer, in giving to the needy, in fasting, in meeting together with the family of believers, in being taught and shaped by the word of Jesus, in offering reproof and taking correction, in celebrating baptisms, in remembering the broken body and the shed blood of our Savior together. We are to be pious or religious but not in the shallow, showy kind of way, but rather in the way Jesus, our Savior, practiced these things. He had a true love for God and his neighbor, and therefore he engaged the people of God. Therefore he, he was pious and religious. He worshiped in spirit and in truth, and we are to do likewise. Brotherly affection, a deeply rooted and practical care for others. And so we are to have a heartfelt desire for the good of our brothers and sisters in Christ. 1 John 3.14 says that we know we have passed out of death into life if, uh, sorry, because we love the brothers. So to have genuine faith is to make every effort to have brotherly affection growing in our lives. The last on the list, love. This is agape love, the kind of unchanging, generous, covenant love God has for his people. Jesus says in John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. Jesus had a patient, full-hearted, kind, honest love which was concerned for the well-being of the lives and souls of those he interacted with. I think this means things like reading 1 Corinthians 13, where love is patient, love is kind, it doesn't envy or boast, it's not arrogant or rude, it doesn't always insist on its own way, it's not irritable or resentful, it doesn't rejoice when things are done wrong, but it rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, it believes all things, it hopes all things, it endures all things. 
And just to clarify, this isn't a wedding verse meant just for your spouse. This is how Paul expected the body of Christ to love one another. We need to learn to have that kind of genuine and committed love for one another. This is why the power of God is working in us, that we might add to our faith this kind of love. And so as we seek in all of these things to supplement our faith with with these qualities, we can't forget the root. It is because God's divine power has granted us the power to live in these things through our knowledge of him that we can now walk growing in these things. Verses 8 to 11. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing... They keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. But in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Oh, what words. They kind of tear your heart between great, great hope and just such a strong warning. I can hear the clear beckon of hope in these words, lifting my soul, calling me forth on the narrow road to a rich welcome home. There's this hope that I don't have to live a life that is ineffective and unfruitful. But in the very strength of God, I can know that I'm his beloved and I can walk forward on the road to Zion, this confident expectation of a warm welcome home. I can hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Come in, partake of the wedding feast of the Lamb. But also there are terrible words of warning in this. The fact that if I'm taking lightly and I am slothful toward the grace offered me, this could reveal the cold reality that I am ineffective and unfruitful. Something that the Spirit of God actually never is. I could be blind to my sinful state and miss the hope which could have saved me. What a dreadful fate to be so close to salvation, to live life amongst those who are being saved, to week after week hear gracious words of Jesus, to hear about his transforming grace, to hear the words of Peter in this letter, if you do not possess virtue and knowledge and self-control and steadfastness and godliness and brotherly affection and love, and these in increasing measure, that this results in being ineffective and unfruitful in your faith. You are forgetting that you are cleansed from your past sins. It is the will of God that we should bear much fruit. In John 15, he promises that, that those who bear fruit, he will prune and he will cause them to bear even more fruit. But for those who do not bear fruit, he will cut off and he will throw into the fire. The salvation of God is marvelous. In Jesus, you are forgiven. You are saved from the penalty your sins deserve. In Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit living in you, giving you the power and ability to walk in the newness of life, putting to death sin and putting on righteousness. And in Jesus, you have the promise that God will get you there. He will get you to a rich welcome home. But if you are not walking with Jesus, if you have some kind of faith in him, that is based only on a prayer you said one time or based in works. If you don't have a growing knowledge of him and a growing obedience and joy in him, beware that you don't have a partial knowledge of the Lord Jesus that hasn't resulted in true faith. That is, that you have actually not believed the true gospel of God's thorough and complete salvation that transfers you out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of his Son, in which you are transformed continually into the likeness of his Son. And so, I urge you this week, take heart, have courage. His divine power has granted to us everything we need for life and godliness, 
through the knowledge of Him who has called us to His glory and excellence. Make every effort, therefore, because this is true, to add to your faith these qualities. Make your calling an election sure, which is a way of saying that you will have assurance that you are God's chosen and beloved son or daughter when you make every effort to add your, to your faith these things, and in doing so, you experience the presence and the power of God in your life. As he is present, present with you as your helper and as your power to grow in these things, you will experience anew that he is indeed with you, that he has not left you alone. This will be evidence to you once again that you are his beloved. This is assurance of your faith that God's power at work in you leads you to see and believe anew that he is real and that he is with you. And it adds to your knowledge of him, um, a delight in who he is, which pushes you back to making every effort. It's it's the beauty of sanctification. It's, it's a growth in holiness that shows you God's goodness, which pushes you back to him, which leads you back to obedience. And in the middle of this, we must acknowledge repentance. <laughs> that is such a big part of this process. We're now moving into celebrating communion. And the reality of it is, is that we sit here this week as a people who have not been virtuous like we should have. You have done things that you, you probably shouldn't have this week. You have not bent your mind toward the knowledge of God with appropriate zeal this week. You've probably struggled with self-control, steadfastness, brotherly affection, and love. There's a reason why faith is the foundation of these virtues for the believer. It is because week after week we get to come to the table with our sin and our shortcomings and be reminded that it was while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, this isn't perfectionism that we're preaching this morning. It's not you came to Jesus and now you're perfect from here on out. This is a growing in and adding to a supplementing your faith with. And the foundation is faith. It's the work of God in your life to make these things real. We just have to get that right. And so we come and as we repent of our sin, that is another evidence that God is at work in our lives and that he has triumphed over sin. Those who pretend they're not in sin lie. They don't live by the truth. It is as we confess our sin that God is seen as the righteous one and the one who is working these things in us. And so we must have confession and repentance, and we must have a growing in obedience. And in Peter's mind, those two things are always linked. In 1 Peter, he says, to those who have been called according to the foreknowledge of God through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus and to be sprinkled by his blood. It's obedience and being sprinkled. And this is the pattern of faith for believers. And so we come this morning remembering that we have not been all that we should, and yet it is precisely in this place that we have the forgiveness of Jesus um, to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness and that we can get get back after obedience, time after time after time. Thank you.